Uh, I really wasn't scheduled to speak today. We had to kind of flip because of schedules and those kind of things. And it's weird how God works because this week, uh, as we're kicking off this series, I was supposed to do a different week. <clears throat> but what God kind of did this week uh, is he, he kind of taught me some things this week in my study. And, and that's always cool when God does that, how he shows up and does something that we weren't even planning on uh, doing but, but he kind of taught me. And so th- today as we kind of dive in, um, we're, we're kind of talking about the next generation. And over the next couple of weeks, we really just want to have a conversation about what that means. And, and as we dive into that, the, the one thing I want you to know a- as we go forward is that we all, uh, we all have, have a, a call from God to, to empower and teach the next generation, to teach them and empower them and, and enable them to, to understand the word of God and who he is and, and what that means to their lives. But today, specifically, I'm going to be talking to parents, uh, and, and next week, Donnie's going to kind of talk on a bigger picture of, of what that means to us as a church and individuals and neighbors and those kind of things. So most of us in this room are parents, but not all of us. Uh, maybe one day you plan to be, those kind of things. Um, but I think <clears throat> as we walk through the scriptures today, hopefully you'll be able, even if you're not a parent, you'll be able to grab some of these concepts and these truths as we reveal them and, and say, yeah, that, that's one way I can interact with the next generation, and ensure that they grab hold of the gospel and see it change and shape their lives the way we want to see it. And let me start off by saying, you know, as, as I told you, I, I learned a lot this week. I'm, I'm a parent uh, of four kids, all under seven, so life is just chaotic and messy and crazy. Uh, it, it's funny, uh, on the way here, my wife just had a wardrobe malfunction in the car and had to run to Target to get a new outfit, so that's, that's how we roll, you know, that's, that's how it happens sometimes. And, and life as a parent can be crazy. And we can have questions, and we don't have an idea sometimes of what we're doing. And so I just want to preface this with, I'm not some guru. This is not a how-to sermon. I'm not going to give you a bunch, of, a bunch of things of, if you do this, this, and this, your kids will turn out great. You know? No, but what I do want to do is open up the scriptures and see what God's call to us as parents should be. And, and I want to say that a call is different than just like a how-to instruction manual. A call is like, that's the guideline, that's the standard, that's what we strive for. That's what God calls us to do. And oftentimes we fall short of that call as parents, as, as individuals, as followers of Christ. And so that's okay, because this week I learned a lot of things as, as I read about what, I'm called, what I should be called to do as a parent uh, from, from God's scriptures. And so I want to dive in first and foremost with this scripture, uh, because as it says, God calls us all, especially as parents, to teach and empower the next generation. And, and this scripture in Psalm 145, verse 4 says this, Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts, let them proclaim your power. And so that's going to set the stage for us over the next couple of weeks as we have this conversation because we have a responsibility, a call from God as parents, as teachers, as partners here at Journey Church to engage the next generation in such a way that we teach them and empower them to know God and experience him in their lives and so that they're able to point other people to that, that hope that they have found in him. And so as we kind of unpack it, we're going to kind of settle in, because there are tons of scriptures throughout, throughout you know, and, and my study this week, I was just like looking up all the scriptures that talk about parenting and children and fathers and, and those kind of things. Uh, and, and there are a multitude of scriptures uh, throughout the Old and New Testament that, that we could have landed on. Uh, but, but I found myself gravitating toward, toward a psalm that we're going to read together and, and talk about today. And it, it's one that I haven't really heard t- talked on that much when it comes to parenting and the next generation and those kind of things. So hopefully... As I've learned some things from this this week, and just share those thoughts with you, that, that you'll be able to leave here with some, some new, new ideas and new concepts, and, and, and at least understand that we're called to a standard uh, as parents and as followers of Christ to teach and empower the next generation in, in a cool way. And so we're going to kind of camp out today on Psalm 78. But before we do that, I really want you to understand that there are basically three influences, three kind of influences in, in the next generation's life and our children's lives. And the first one of those is we all have a parent or a family. Nobody just like appears on the earth. Somehow they get here, and I'm not going to get into all that. Um, but, but we all have a parent or family. Every kid, every, every person of the next generation has a parent or family. Now, I don't know how the interactions are between those parents and those families. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing or, or how that shaped them. But it is an influence on every young person. On, on every teenager, on every child, that there's, there's parental and family influence in their lives. That affects all, all people of the next generation. The second thing we see is the church. And, and as we're in here, hopefully the church has some sort of influence on our life and on the next generation's life, on our children's lives. Hopefully we've allowed the church to, to have some sort of influence on their lives. Now, that's not the case with every kid. Not every kid gets experience the church having a kind of influence on their life. 
but hopefully our kids are rubbing shoulders with those kids and, and thus having an influence on them somehow, some way. But the church doesn't always have an influence, whereas parents and family are always influential in, in a child's life. The church can be, cannot be, it just depends on that, that family situation. And then lastly, culture. I could have listed a lot more things, but I just kind of used culture to encompass every other kind of influence on a child's life, whether it be peers, friends, social media, what they read, where they go, those kind of things. Culture kind of encapsulates a lot of things, and that has an influence on our young people, and it can have a major influence on their life. So basically, there are, there are these three kind of influences in the child's life. The two main ones are, are family and culture. And then for us as believers, as followers of Christ, we, we have this thing called the church that we can rely on to influence them and teach them and, and help us as we teach them. And so I just want to just throw that out there at the beginning. So we're going to unpack in Psalm 78, if, you, if you've got your Bibles or tablets or whatever, you can look it up. Psalm 78, we're going to start in verse 4. We'll have it on the screens as well. And we're going to kind of read through the whole passage together first. And then uh, there are kind of five things that stuck out to me this week as I was kind of reading through it and uh, just learning about the call that we have as parents, as followers of Christ, as people who want to influence our, our children in, in the right way for God. And so let's read it all together, and then we'll kind of come back and visit some of these scriptures as we unpack these truths. It says, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave, he gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so that the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. And this is then they will will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Nobody wants their kids to end up like that, right? Stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their heart to God. That's not like in the game plan of life. Like, I really hope my kid grows up to be really stubborn. You know, I really hope they're unfaithful. I I really hope these things happen. Nobody, Nobody, that's not the game plan. And so, so in this, this psalm, we see that. And if you know anything about Israel's history, you know that they had this continual, uh, endless cycle of like getting everything right with God, figuring it all out, and then messing it all up. Getting it right, figuring it all out, and then messing it up. And so the hope in this psalm is that hopefully as parents, we can, the call is to do, do, do a few things so that they don't end up as the ancestors, as the previous generation, so they don't mess up like we messed up. That's our, that's our heart's desire for our children, Right? is that they don't make the same mistakes that we made, that they don't mess up where we messed up, that they don't, that they don't have to experience some of the things that we experienced. That, that's our hope. And I believe that there's a call out there as parents that if we can walk through this and, and see these things, that it can totally shape the way we parent and ultimately the way our kids view God and, and interact with him as they, as they live their lives. And so we'll just jump right in because the first thing that, that kind of stood out to me uh, as we're reading through this uh, is, is that Ultimately, this seems like the, the easiest starting point, but sometimes we get it all messed up, and it's that we keep God at the center. We've got to teach our children that, that God is the most important thing in all of life. As culture tries to influence them, as friends try to influence them, as social media, and whatever it may be, tries to influence them and, and take hold of the center of their life and, and make it where they live their lives all about this and all about that, that careers and, and, and the, the next hottest guy, whatever it may be, So many things can take the center of our children's lives. And it's up to us as parents to ensure that God is always at the center of who they are and what they do. And they understand that God is at the center of everything. That at the end of the day, God is the highest value in all of life. And that only happens if you and me and us, corporately as a church, live our lives that way. If we live our lives in such a manner that shows that God is the highest value of everything, that it's not about jobs and it's not about impressing this and it's not about that. It's all about God. Everything begins and ends in God. And ultimately, his pers- the, the, the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how he displayed his love for us. And so we've got to teach our children. We've got to make sure they understand that God is at the center of everything, of who they are, of who they'll be, of all of life. God's at the center. So we've got to make sure they understand that. And he speaks to this in verse 4 of Psalm 78, it says, we will not hide these truths from our children. And here's the part, we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord and his power and his mighty wonders. We'll explain to them that God is the highest value, 
that he's mighty, that he's glorious, that he's done amazing things and he will continue to do amazing things. And that is what you need to build your life on. That's the only thing worth keeping at the center of all you are and all you do. God must be at the center. And as parents, we must display that in our lives and we must continually teach that to our children. As we go forward, we've got to ensure that God's the highest value for them. Second thing that stands out in this passage of Scripture to me is that we've got to teach them about God's Word. We've got to teach them about God's Word. I know that sounds like a no-brainer, but some of us get that all messed up. We've got to teach them about God's Word because it stands to reason that if God should be at the center, if He's the highest value, if He's the most important thing, then whenever you're trying to figure out what to do in certain situations or how to view certain things, probably His Word is probably the most important Word that you can have. And we, we're lucky enough to have something called the Bible, which is God's word to us in this day. And if God's the highest value in the center of all they do, we've got to understand what he says and how he views things that are happening around us. And we've got to teach our children how to read God's word, how, how, how to do that, how to understand his word, how to apply his word. We just came out of an, a, cool, a cool series called Read Your Bible. And I love that I'm a part of a church that values so much the reading of Scripture that we try to give you tools and, and, and just in your personal life so that you're able to read your Bible because your kids are watching what you do. If you never open your Bible, if you never study His Word, if you never pay attention to, to what's going on, guess what? There, there, there's a greater chance that they're not going to care about it either. We've got to be the ones to take ownership and responsibility for teaching about God's Word. Because if he's the highest value and the most important thing, we've got to know what he says about certain situations and those kind of things. See, I view God's word kind of like, kind of like, a, like the sun in the solar system. See, the sun is the center of the solar system. It provides light and warmth and, and everything else revolves around that sun. God's word is like that for our lives. And we've got to help our kids understand that, that That the Bible, in order for it to be the lens that we see everything through, it has to be at the center. It has to be important. And we have to model that and show them that and teach them that. We have to teach them about God's words and his ways. Third thing. Oh, we'll read the scripture. Sorry about that. Uh, Verse 5 talks to this. It says, For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. And then he commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. That's the command from God. That's the call from God. It's not only is he the sinner, but we're called to teach his word. Third thing that stands out in this passage is that we've got to provide opportunities for them to learn and know God. I know that may sound a little bit redundant based on the last one to teach them, but how many of you understand that there's a difference between teaching and knowledge? There's a, there's a huge difference between teaching and knowledge. See, we're responsible to be teachers, but we can't make our kids learn. We can't make them understand and know things. We, we can teach them and hope that they get it and hope that it connects. Anybody ever, ever taught something a million times and you're like, why is my kid not getting this? I've probably said this a hundred times. For, in our house, it's pick up your stuff when you're finished playing. I must have said that a million times in seven years. Still doesn't happen. See, there's this gap between what I'm trying to teach and what they learn or what they know. And the sad thing for us as parents, and this is the hardest thing for us as parents, is realizing that that gap is something we can't cross for them. We can't close it for them. We can't can't bring them from here to there. Our responsibility is to teach, and we have to entrust and have faith in the God that's the center of all to bring them from here to there, to provide knowledge. As parents, we provide opportunities for them to learn and know and experience God. You go over to Kid Street, there's opportunities to learn and know and experience God on their level. You go to the garage, there's opportunities for them to learn and know and experience God on their level. The path. We spend a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of volunteers and a lot of budget to make sure that our children have opportunities here at Journey to know and experience and learn about God. So that, hopefully, between our teaching and what we want them to know and understand, that that gap is much easier to cross. That's our heart's desire. That's our hope. That's why we do what we do. That's why we take a couple weeks out of the year to talk specifically about the next generation. It's because it's that important. But there's a gap there, and we, we, we can't take them from here to there. And this is the hardest thing about parenting that I've learned so far. I'm still a rookie at this. You know, I'm, I'm seven years in, but 
You know, I still feel like a rookie. I still feel like I mess it up way more than I get it right. I still feel like I've, I've made way more mistakes. Sometimes I feel like I've totally blown it. Uh, you guys know how I feel if you're a parent. Sometimes you just have those moments where, am I doing it right? Am I making a difference at all? And it's the hardest thing as parents because more seasoned parents that are way down the road, they spent years teaching, bringing them, providing opportunities, and their kid still doesn't get it. I had a conversation this morning with a gentleman who, who did everything, took his kid to the VBSs, taught them in Sunday school, took, brought them along. The kids are in their 20s, moved off, and they, they still don't get it. And you can see his heart just breaking. Broke his heart even today as a parent, and that's a hard thing. But like I told him, we, we have a responsibility to them to teach them. But at the end of the day, we have to provide opportunities for them to respond and know, and we're not responsible for that. Ultimately, we, we have to trust God to do what only God can do. And we do what we can do. And our call as parents is to, to teach them and, and to provide opportunities for them to learn and know and experience God. See, no matter how good the teaching is, sometimes knowledge comes along slowly. We can all relate to that if you look back on your life as a kid, as a teenager, as, you know, me into my 20s even. It took me a long time to put it all together, but it happened. And I was taught the right things. I had great parents. Not every kid has that advantage, but our call as followers of Christ is to teach them and provide those opportunities for them to learn and know and experience God. And no matter how good the teaching is, sometimes knowledge comes along slowly. Here's what it says in Psalm. It says, so the next generation might know them. That's, that's, that's the heart's desire. Not that they just get taught things, but that they know them. Even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. We want our children to know these things so much that they're ingrained in them that when they start having kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, that, that they're going to continue to teach because they understand and they know that God's the center. That they know his word's true. So we provide opportunities. Fourth thing that stands out in this passage to me is that we've got to help them find their hope in God. We help them provide, we, we, we help them to find their hope in God. That's our call as parents. We've got to help them. Not find their hope in a job or in a spouse or in a neighborhood or in, in something else. Not to put their hope and put, put everything they've got into that, but to find their hope in God and in God alone. And hopefully if you've placed him at the center and taught his word and provided opportunities for them to learn and know, hopefully that begins to happen, that they begin to understand God is my ultimate hope. He's my anchor. He, he's everything I need and all I want. Verse 7 talks about this. It says, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles, obeying his commands. Set their hearts anew on the hope of God. Set its hope anew on God. See, the goal isn't for our children just to have knowledge about God. That's useless. Knowledge is useless unless it leads to action. My goal as a parent isn't that my kid would know all the, all the Bible stories inside and out, know all the characters. It's that those characters would point back to the person and work of Jesus Christ in such a way that it shapes them and changes them so, so that they're telling their friends about those stories, that they're pointing their friends to hope. That's the goal. The goal isn't knowledge. That's the starting point. The goal is for them to, to find their hope in God, to be anchored in him. And we, we do this in a, in a cool way. I know a lot of churches probably do cool things, but, but I really love Journey, and one of the things we do here on our Kid Street side, and you may not even be aware of this, but um, we use this. You ever heard the thing called, uh, it's just a phase? You ever heard that, that, that saying? It's just a phase. Well, it turns out there's actual statistical scientific data that, that, that most things are just a phase, that there are different phases that our kids go through. And as they walk through these phases, there are different ways to interact with them and, and different ways to talk with them and, and help them learn things. And so, so there's kind of this whole deal called the phase. And, and, it, and it, we've got this poster hanging over on Kid Street. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but, but this is what we believe, that, that a phase is a time frame in a kid's life when you can leverage distinctive opportunities to influence their future. And so I've had four kids, so I've been through a lot of baby baptisms here at Journey. And uh, each one we get a different gift, so it's, it's, I'll just wait for the next one to see what, what kind of cool gift we're going to get. Well, one of them, we got these things called phase cards, and uh, they're, they're kind of bound together. I've got them in my office, and, um, 
it's really cool. They kind of break it down into these different phases that there's like zero to one and then two to three and, you know, on and on that there's all these different phases, developmentally, socially, uh, all these things, mentally that they're going through. And I, I can tell you on more than one account, I've asked myself, what is going on with this kid? What is he doing? What is she doing? What are they doing? And I'll, I'll just glance at those phase cards and I'll read it and I'll be like, oh, that makes sense. That's the phase that they're in. That's why they're doing that. And it gives me, it gives me ways to kind of help them and interact with them as they're walking through that phase. Such a cool thing, such a cool concept. And it's rooted and grounded in science. And I think Donnie may get into some of that. You know, he's, he's one of those, he gets geeked out on stats and, and those kind of things. So I'm going to leave all that to him. He'll get on the science side. You know, I'm just going to get on the practical side uh, of this thing. But I want to show you this, this other slide that we've got that, that comes out of this, this whole phase thing. As you see there, we've got loving God is at the center. God's at the center of all we do. And it should be at the center of all our kids are and who they are. But as you see these concentric circles that go out, we basically believe that there are three basic truths, that if we can get these three basic truths instilled in our children's lives, it will totally change who they become as adults later on in their life. It will change how they view the world. It will change how they view the gospel. It will change how they interact with people in terms of the gospel. And so as you see these concentric circles, they're, they're kind of these three basic truths, and they're built on these phases. But you've got preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school. I want to zoom in on a couple of them just to read them because I, I love it. This is such a cool concept and it's such a cool way to interact and teach these truths and, and help them understand that their hope should be in God alone. And the first one, it, it's, it's how we interact with God. And as you can see, the, the very first one as a preschooler, as a little, little child, is super simple. This is how you interact with God. This is what you should know about God is that God made me. Simple. But as it progresses, you see, ultimately, as it goes down to high school, what we want them to know is not only did God make me, but, but he created me to pursue a relationship with him. See how it goes a little deeper? Their understanding advances, their, their mental capacities advances, their emotional strength advances. That They, they don't need to just know that, that God made them, but they need to know, why did he make me? Why did he make me? Why did he put me here? And so one of the basic truths we try to answer is that he created you for a relationship with him how it interacts with, our, with ourselves, how God, God affects us. Not only did he make me, but as a preschooler, we want to know that God loves me. He loves me. He made me and he loves me. Pretty simple. But then as, as the phases continue, as, as the different things happen, you see as a high schooler, not only do we want him to know that, that he loves me, but, but because he loves me, I can trust what Jesus did to transform who, who I need to become. It gets deeper because... The phase changes who they are. It changes what they can understand. It changes how they interact with God and with the world. And lastly, how we interact with others. As, as, a, as, a, as a preschooler, we want them to understand not only does God, did he make me and he loves me, but he wants to be my friend forever. Sometimes I just need to hear those three statements. God made me, he loves me, and, and he wants to be my friend forever. But that's how we approach it, how they interact with others, But ultimately, what, what we want that to lead to as a high schooler and on into their adult life is that we exist to demonstrate God's love to those around me. That's the basic truth. We want our children to understand that they exist, as we say it here, here at Journey Church, they exist to humbly point everyone to absolute hope. And that absolute hope is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you can't tell a preschooler, listen, you exist to demonstrate God's love to everyone around you. They're going to say, candy? I mean, there's not, it's not going to connect. But if you tell a preschooler, hey, Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Cool, I like friends. Friends are awesome. They're going to get that. And so on us, for, to help them find their hope in God, I love this, this whole phase concept. And it's, it's, it's changed the way that I try to approach these truths because I want, I want to start here. I want them to know right out of the gate, hey, you exist for more than yourself. You exist to point other people to hope. You know, isn't that cool? You know, that's what I want them to know right out of the gate. Before they're crawling, I want them to know that. But the reality is they're not going to understand that. But they can understand that they've got a friend in Jesus who will never leave their side, who will always be with them, and they can put their hope in him. Such a cool concept, and, and I, you know, Donnie will probably get into some of this a little more next week, but I want you to know that, that that's, that's what we're teaching on Kid Street. If you've ever wondered and not ever stepped over there, these are the truths we're teaching. Powerful, life-changing, 
And I love that, that, I, that I'm a part of a church that doesn't put it on just me as a parent to, to help my kid figure it out, but that they partner with me and provide teaching like this to help them and encourage them and to help us along the way. Such a cool thing. The last, the last kind of deal that stands out to me is, and this one comes back on us a good bit, is at the end of the day, it's up to us to model a life of obedience. As parents, it's up to us to model a life of obedience. You know, there's that old saying, do as I do, not as I say, right? That's an old saying. We, we, I want my kids to, to be able to look at my life and know what they should do, know how they should live, know what they should be doing. It's not always the case because I'm not perfect. That's why it's ultimately important for them to find their hope in, in God and God alone, not in me. But we do have to model a life of obedience. Verse 7 speaks to this. Again, it says, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. The only way that, that Israel was not going to repeat the sins of the past, that their ancestors that we read about in verse 8, becoming stubborn and, and unfaithful, was to place God at the center, to learn his words, to put their hope in him in such a way that it created a life of obedience to them so that they wouldn't repeat the sins of their fathers and their, their grandfathers and, and, and the history of Israel. That was their hope, and that's our hope. If we want our culture and our nation changed for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it begins and ends with God and putting our hope in him and, and us creating children and young people who are obedient to his word because they understand and know that the highest value in all of life is God. That's the call. See, when our children find their hope in God, hopefully they'll be much more inclined to be obedient followers of his word. And this only happens if we as parents take the responsibility, own up to the fact that we've got a job to model it. That means if you get mad in traffic and stomp and say things maybe you shouldn't say and your kids are in the back seat. We shouldn't do it anyway, but especially if your kids are in the back seat because guess what? They're watching and they're going to model that. If you're not generous with what you have, guess what? Your kids are going to be greedy. They're going to grow up greedy and selfish. We model. Our kids do what we model. The behaviors we model, the things we do, they will do. So are you being obedient? Are you modeling a life of obedience to God? Because at the end of the day, we're not perfect as parents. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and throw that out the window. We're, we're not perfect, nor will we ever be. We'll get it wrong more than we get it right. But hopefully on those moments we get it right, it's through obedience. And hopefully, if we've done our job correctly, they won't be looking at us to be the ultimate hope in their lives they'll find their hope in, in the person and work of Jesus Christ and in God the Father. See, at the end of the day, having a perfect kid and a perfect family, it's not the win. I mean, sure, I like getting compliments when I go out with four kids by myself as a dad, you know. They're like, man, you do such a great job. I'm like, you're right, I do. <laughs> it feels good. I mean, it feels good for people to compliment you on how well-behaved your kids are and how good they are and how, how, how that kind of thing goes. It feels good. It's not the win. I don't go home and at the end of the day think, done. I have won. I have defeated this parenting thing. No, the, the, the ultimate win as a follower of Christ, as a parent that's trying to live up to the call that we have as parents, is that at the end of the day, our, our children would become faithful, obedient stewards for his kingdom and for his sake. That's the win. And yeah, there are times where it doesn't look like that's going to happen. There are times that it's going to be rough. And there are times where, where we're going to mess it up and, and they're going to mess it up. But it's up to us to help them understand. If you keep God at the center, if you, if you read his words and let that be the lens, you filter everything else through. If the first place you go is, what does God have to say about this? If you teach them the words, if you model obedience, if you help them put their hope in in God and in God alone and not, a, not anything else. You model obedience in your life. Hopefully at the end of the day, hopefully at the end of, you know, I've got a, a seven-month-old and, and hopefully when he's 18 and God help graduate in high school, 
I can look back and see a kid who is a faithful, obedient steward for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of God's kingdom. Because they understand that God's the highest value in all of life. That's the win as a parent. That's what God's been teaching me this week. And so I pray and I hope that these words that I've shared would somehow resonate in your life. That these simple five things would just take root. You may be already doing all these things. I hope and pray that you are. But I promise you, that's the call as parents. And if if we can do that, if we can begin the process of doing these things, it'll totally change the way our kids interact and view God, view the gospel, view those around them. So let me pray for us. God, I thank you. I'm humbled by your grace, your love. Sometimes I'm blown away that, that the call to us seems so above anything we can accomplish. And God, I think that's on purpose so that we wouldn't rely on our own talents or merits or abilities, God, that, that ultimately we would rely on your power, your strength, your Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, and walk with us as we strive to be the parents that you've called us to be, as we strive to be the, the volunteers that you've called us to be, as we strive to be the, the teachers and neighbors and people that you've called us to be as a, as a body of believers. And I thank you for, for a church like Journey that takes time to, to talk about the next generation, that believes that the, the next generation isn't just waiting on some day out in the future, but God, they can be leaders now, that they can point people to hope now, that they can reveal your, your truth and your love and your grace and your mercy right now. And so God, I pray for the parents in this room, God, that as they struggle through whatever phase they find themselves in with their lives, whether it's changing diapers or trying to figure out where their kids are on a Friday night. God, I pray that you would just encourage them, that you would strengthen them, that you would help them to just read these four simple verses, four verses that we've talked about today that provide so much insight to what it means to keep you at the center of all we do, to teach our children what it means to follow and obey your commands, to be obedient and faithful in everything we do in life. That's the real challenge in parenting. It's it's not some magical formula. It's modeling a life that is completely dependent on you. And so God, I pray that as we do that, that you would help us, that you would empower us, that you would enable us because it's the only way it's possible. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen.